I'm just going to start the, the discussion going first. Uh, first by asking Raju, uh, uh, if even after they certify, we still can have outages, you know, like in, even in the case of first server in Japan, uh, what then would you recommend our uh, cloud service provider as well, and then as well as the user of cloud service provider to do in order to minimize, uh, you know, the impact of such outage. Uh, is, just, is it just to adopt your guidelines, or you know, or maybe you to share a bit more about the the the, the 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 nature or the content of the guideline? You know. So according to me, the biggest issue that the cloud service provider has to lose is not money, is reputation. The cloud service provider's biggest asset is its reputation. If word gets around on social media that this specific cloud provider is not reliable, has outages, and does not inform SMEs or end users that there is an outage, planned or unplanned, then that cloud service provider will get very, uh, I mean, it will be very difficult for that CSP to attract new business because reputation is a number one issue in public cloud. As far as the end user is concerned, you have to protect your business first. It's not the responsibility of the cloud service provider. It's not the responsibility of the government. It's your responsibility because it's your business. It's your customers. It's your suppliers. It's your database. Therefore, I would say keep a DR or BCDR or in-premise of your most critical workloads. Because if that's on the cloud and whatever reason there is latency or there is non-availability or there's a security attack and that service becomes unavailable, your customer doesn't care whether the cloud service provider is unavailable. He cares that you are not providing that service to him and he will sue you. He will damage your reputation. Therefore, make sure you have secured your reputation by having 100% what we would technically call active-active DR in place by having in-premise your most critical workloads and use the cloud only for passive or archival or for workloads that are not hypercritical. On the other hand, you can use the cloud for hypercritical uh, workloads. However, make sure you have a copy in-premise as well. Thanks. Thank you, Raju. So uh, if this is the case, that there is so much at stake, both for the cloud service provider as well as for the user uh, to protect their asset and to ensure that there is sufficient uh, level of uh, service delivered, then it's kind of common sense that they would want to do it. So is it still necessary to regulate it, uh, Stacey? Well, of course, it's, it's, it, it, when you say regulate, do you mean regulate cloud or regulate, uh, make sure that regulatory compliance is adhered right. to? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, however you mean you may regulate to be when you use the word regulation in okay. your presentation. Well, I think that it, it, you know, regardless of what the technology is behind any industry, if it's a regulated industry, or if there are cons you know, regulatory compliance issues such as privacy laws, that you really need to make sure that your cloud service meets those obligations for your customer. The customer is the regulated entity, uh, and that isn't going to change. Now, it isn't to say that regulations can't ad adapt to enable the use of new technologies, but, but in the case of cloud computing, you're still going to need certain, you know, the, the, your customers are going to need business resilience, uh, auditability. In some cases, as in the case of the financial services industry, they're going to have to know where their data is. They're going to have to know how their data is being used, and it's not being used by the cloud service provider for some other purpose. Uh, so there are going to always be regulatory compliance issues if you are dealing with a regulated, uh, either regulated data or regulated customer. Thank you, Stacey. So it looks like, depending on the sector, right? So financial services, it will tend towards 
regulation. Yes, and also if you're dealing with non-regulated entities that have customer information that might be protected by a privacy law or something like that, you still have similar... Uh, I think by now most of you would have heard about the MTCS, the Multi-Tier uh, Cloud Security Standard that's been developed by uh, IDA uh, together with the uh, in, uh, IT Standards Committee in Singapore. And, and that is to set out like different level of services and so an expectation so that the end user would know what to expect when they contract you know, or they get into an agreement with, uh, with, with, with the cloud service provider. So you know, either uh, Raju or Stacey, uh, uh, do you think this multi-tier approach is appropriate? Or are, are, are you all do multi-tier? Have you seen this approach been adopted in other countries for cloud services? in terms of having a standard or, or, or guidelines? I, I think, I would like to think as a Singaporean that Singapore is the first in the world to have this multi-tier approach. And the reason is very simple. You need to have multi-tier because SLAs are different depending on the tier. Now let's say you are on the highest tier and you want mission critical services and you want an uptime of 99.999 percent. Therefore, the cloud service provider who signs on that SLA has to make sure that he is giving you 200 percent redundancy. That means he is replicating your workload in premise in the data center in Singapore and possibly another copy of it in a data center outside of Singapore. So that if the primary data center fails, he can pull it out from the secondary data center in about one hour or 30 minutes or whatever time that the SLA requires. But you are paying a high price for that. Whereas if you are on the lowest tier, you are paying a very low price where you are getting probably 95% availability. Therefore, you have a downtime of up to four hours of unplanned downtime. So think about it. Therefore, if you didn't have these tiers, you would either be all paying the same high amount, or you would all be paying zero, like you do right now for YouTube. YouTube, Gmail, you don't pay any money. Therefore, if the service goes down, you have no indemnity. You cannot sue Google, right? Whereas you pay money to salesforce.com, and if you are on a high priority there, salesforce.com must ensure that the service is available for you 24-7 without an outage. So that's why three tier makes sense. Thank you, Raju. How about uh, a view from our overseas colleague? Well, I, I think that, uh, I'm, I, first of all, I'm a big advocate of standards. I think that having, I'm sorry. Uh, first of all, I'm a big advocate of standards. I think that having a standardized approach is very important. And I think you're right. Uh, Singapore is a first. And it's, a, it's, a, it's uh, an eyes wide open, very smart approach. Uh, to developing a standard around this. Uh, for financial services, and I think this is applicable a little more broadly than uh, just the financial services, uh, we uh, at ACCA and another trade association, the Open Computing Alliance, developed uh, what we call the safe cloud principles for FSI, which address many of the same issues. And I can go into this in a little bit later in detail, but I think that regardless whether it's uh, using NIST standards or ISO standards, or, or, or in this case we're talking about uh, IDA's platform, I think it's very important that the industry look at solving problems across the industry and, and across uh, the globe. It has, they have to implement standards. Thank you, Stacy. Now, moving on, uh, as you know, this segment, we're going to talk about computer security as well. So I understand from Raju that his uh, guideline uh, do not cover security breaches, but cover uh, outage incidents. So just want to check you know, uh, whether or not, uh, you know, we respect because security obviously is also a cyber threats and cyber security are important issues. Huh? Uh, how would you suggest uh, some of this may be addressed or could be addressed, whether with this guideline or extended guidelines? So that's a good question. There is already a security guideline in place, which is already now a standard under ITSC. It is called MTCS, Multi Tier Cloud Security. And even though it is not law yet, 
I hope it will be because it affects all of us. If there is a security attack, if there is a DDoS on your workload in your data center or in the CSP's data center, somebody has to figure out that it has been a security attack. It is probably either malicious or it is probably directed, which means some special, I mean, some organization like uh, the mafia is directing deliberate security attacks, and that is taken care of by MTCS. So we don't go there because it's already an established standard. IDA is already implementing that in the guidelines as well as in, uh, in tenders to ensure that only cloud service providers who have passed the MTCS standard and have been certified in tier one or two or three can bid for IDA or government contracts. That's the way to go without even ma making it into a legislation. The moment the government says, yes, you must pass the standards, otherwise I'm not going to give you contracts, that already becomes a de facto standard. You know, just on the check, if Stacey has any comments to add to that uh, around security and cyber threats, how we can manage and help to address those uh, incidents? Well, I, first of all, I don't know if everybody in the room is a, is a Singapore company, so I would look at, you know, I think you also have to look at ISO standards. Uh, NIST is developing standards in the U.S. that will be, you know, adopted globally. Um, Can you all hear at the back? I'm sorry, I'll hold the microphone closer. <laughs> so what I was, uh, just to observe that in addition to the uh, uh, IDA standards, the if you're looking at a global market, you also have to be looking at, at for instance, the ISO standard, 27,000 series standards, uh, and uh, uh, NIST uh, 800 series standards, which are under development. Um, it's, you know, again, these are very, very, the, the NIST is a, is a framework, actually, not a process, so I should be very clear about that. And it's, it's an approach to uh, establishing the processes regarding classifying data or categorizing it, selecting the appropriate security, co uh, security controls in regard to the particular data, uh, obviously testing and assessing security controls, authorizing, uh, you know, it's ac access and authorization, and then monitoring the security state, all of these things in a framework. So there are a number of, I think, there are a number of standards that you really should be looking at as you uh, consider your security issues. Thank you, Stacy. I, I, I suppose this goes back to the keynote address uh, in the morning where Ace Kung from IDA also stressed uh, the need and the use of standards and how that could help both the service provider to design the service to ensure a certain level of security as well as to assure the level of security uh, from the, the user can, design, can, can, can acquire uh, when arranging uh, service with the uh, CSP. So we have uh, about five minutes left. So I'd like to open now to the floor for questions. Any questions for Raju or Stacey, please? You should have enough time to have think of the question by now. Question? Let me make a comment while we're waiting for that first hand to rise. I think when I think about cloud security and then map the question of cloud security, and you described outages, which are obviously significant, uh, but, they, but the largest security breaches, as we all know the statistics, in the last two years, the largest security breaches were eBay, Target, Home Depot, JP Morgan, the great bank robbery with 100 banks around the world, 30 countries, none of these were cloud services. And so the question of cloud security has to be mapped against cloud, uh, against security reality. And, uh, you know, there's the, uh, you can look at it anecdotally and say, well, who's going to play, a, who's going to be more concerned about cloud security, somebody who focuses 24-7 on it, or somebody who has a department that pays attention to all of its other IT co concerns as well as making sure that they're secure. But once you meet those standards, once you have the practices in place, you have a product to sell against the question who's more secure? 
you do have to make that threshold of ensuring that you have done everything you are supposed to do to uh, have the highest level of security. Thank you, Stacy. Any questions on the floor, please? If not, then I'm going to ask one more question to the two of them before we close. So given that the cloud services, you know, the, the adoption of cloud services is, is here, and it will be, you know, and it's not something that we can think that it will go away. Uh, it's kind of almost like a given that it will occur and in one way or another it will touch your business. So uh, what advice would you give someone um, if they are not yet a user of cloud services and they're intending to go into one, what is the one piece of advice you want to give to that user of cloud services, what they should look out for uh, you know, to make that first step to get into the adoption of cloud service? So according to me, if you are a user, you should ask your cloud service provider to give you confirmed SALT, S-A-L-T. S is security. What security services do they have in place to ensure your workloads are always secure in their cloud? A is for availability. Availability means it should be available to your device anytime, anywhere, on any device, as long as a device is connected to the internet. L for latency. Latency is very important because on an SSL layer, if you are offering e-commerce, the highest latency is 20 seconds. If your e-commerce transaction doesn't finish in 20 seconds, that will lapse. Therefore, you must offer, or they must offer you the lowest latency for your service or for your customer service. And T is for transparency. Transparency is important because we understand clouds are also human. Clouds also break down. Clouds also are not 24-7. However, the least you should get from your cloud service provider is transparency, that he should call you or send you an email saying, hey, my service is down. Hey, I'm, sub I'm having an outage. Hey, I'm having a DDoS. Hey, your, your workload is affected. Or whatever the case might be. Transparency is the clearest way to establish trust. And unless there is transparency between the cloud service provider and you, the customer, or the end user, the whole system will not work. That's my advice to you. Actually, I would start with the premise that you're a cloud service user now because invariably there are cloud services floating around your enterprise, whether you know it or not. You may be entirely on Google's Gmail, and therefore you know it. You may have devices in your business, and so you've got apps and other things, and the devices running on the cloud. You're likely running a remote access system that uses the internet to connect. So start off with the premise that they are coming into this using the technology, they just don't know it or they may know it, and then recognize what risks are involved and, and that you are ready to address those risks one by one, step by step. The things that you've listed are important and are, are a great hallmark. So look at the evolving environment that your business is going to be doing business in. It, the, it, the cloud is there. It's going to be part of the business process. Think about the risk and how you together can work to mitigate and manage risk and what the risk, uh, the, the level of risk tolerance is for the business and with regard to particular data. Think about the Internet of Things coming. Think about how this is all evolving. And then step back and with those criteria and a few others that, that uh, you can find in our ACCA reports or on our, our website uh, and elsewhere in standards, since I'm plugging standards so heavily here, uh, help your customer manage their risk going into the cloud. Thank you very much, uh, Stacy. So as you have no questions, I'm just going to close this now and say that uh, first, there are a lot of acronyms being thrown around. 
but just remember the following. Go and look at MTCS. This is the, our Singapore standards for cloud security. Right? Publish here, you can get hold of a copy of it, and you can educate yourself about what kind of security requirements you need, you desire uh, in engaging a service provider. And if, for example, you're already using a service and you're not aware of it, please be, as uh, Stacy had said, at least make some uh, risk assessment, which is very common now, right? Everybody does this risk assessment. And you can apply the same risk assessment to a cloud service as you would to a business process. But finally, and very interestingly, I think you just have to take more SALT, right? The S-A-L-T as recommended by Raju. If you forgot what SALT stands for, Remember, what is it? Uh, S, security, availability, latency, and transparency, right? Uh, take that and you are done. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time.